Thank you, President Reese. Congratulations, graduates. With this ritual, you're marking the culmination of years of hard work, deep commitment, and this launches you into a new stage of your life with a certification that you are now qualified, even more than you ever were, to do the work that you care to do. So I'm thrilled to bask it with you in this moment of your achievement to mark it and to think with you for a minute about the anticipation of a life of meaningful work into which you now step. And I realize for many of you, you're already doing it, but you're now doing it with both a new credential and new knowledge. I want to tell you a story for, if you were at convocation last fall, I'm going to, this is a little piece of what I talked about then. Um, but this is a personal story about how early life choices can shape the rest of your life. The story is about my father, who was um, a Methodist minister in South Carolina. Now, since I don't think most of you grew up in the South, and even if you did, you didn't see the world I grew up in and my father grew up in, where segregation was legal. Signs were everywhere. Most restaurants had a whites only sign. Toilets had a whites or colored. Um, water fountains, schools were segregated. Buses, when I got on the bus to go downtown to my fourth grade uh, music lesson, I watched black people have to walk to the back of that bus. Um, it was everywhere. It was legally enforced, and behind that legal enforcement was the threat of violence. And this was very, very real. It traced itself back to the legacy of slavery. My father grew up in a small town. Um, he went to seminary in the 1930s at Duke University. He was something of a mystic, certainly an idealist, um, decided he was a pacifist as war broke out. He later decided he should be a chaplain in the Navy, that he could serve better that way. Um, but he graduated seminary right on the eve of the war, and his first assignment was at the big downtown Methodist church in Columbia, South Carolina, the capital of the state. Um, he was the associate pastor, you know, the one who worked with youth and who filled in from time to time when the preacher was on vacation. Washington Street Church was burned down in the middle of the Civil War, or near the end, by Sherman's troops. They were looking for the First Baptist Church where the Articles of Secession had been signed. And somebody at that church said, oh no, this isn't the one, go around the corner, burn that one. So they did, and that was Washington Street Church. My father and many of the people he went to seminary with, I know because I've now gone back and read some of his papers and some of the student publications from those years, were, they were aware that in addition to the dilemma of war in the world, they faced the moral dilemma of race and of segregation, and they didn't have a good language to talk about it with, nor did they have any models of people around them who broke the taboos and the rules. So this was eating at him. And in the summer of 1942, the preacher was on vacation. He said, Claude, fill in. My father is J. Claude Evans. Um, and at that point, Daddy pondered the words of Paul in Acts 17, 26, where he said, God has made all men, of course, generic, right? We really know that includes the rest of us of one blood, has made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And he felt like he had an epiphany. Oh, oh, that's it. We really are of one blood. I just have to tell everybody. So he preached his sermon on that text. And he used that text to challenge the idea pervasive in the South that race was biological 
that people were fundamentally different based on race. And he said, you know what? We really are of one blood. We all have type A, type B, type O, AB, you know, plus minus, but that doesn't separate by race. Some people have blue eyes and some have brown in all races, or at least both blacks and whites too. Some have curlier hair, some have straighter hair. He argued there was no great difference in intelligence um, by citing examples of achieving African Americans. He broke all the rules. And he ended his sermon saying, not far from this city at Fort Jackson, soldiers are training to go to war in Europe to save us for democracy and against tyranny. Those men, and they were mostly, almost all men, if they live in South Carolina cannot vote. South Carolina Democrats, who were the dominant party, had a, a primary that was designated white only. And so he ended his sermon with a challenge, a political challenge to the white primary, saying we are betraying what we stand for. Well, you can imagine that was not well received. He was hauled on the carpet the next day. The preacher was brought back from vacation. He was sat down with all the elders of the church and told, Claude, you will never preach here again, and we're sending you away as far as we can get you. The Methodist Church has a system of assignment, so he wasn't actually completely fired. He was sent into exile. I call it Siberia, the tiny town of McCormick on the border of Georgia, where there was a church that was so small and so old and had only had burned out, broken down preachers for so long that what this 25-year-old did to be sent there, they didn't care. They just loved him. What I later learned after he died was that from that moment he became a hero to his entire cohort of Methodist ministers in the state of South Carolina and an emblem of courage. And many of them strove through their lives to get up the courage to say the kind of words he had said. What he then did was spend the rest of his life raising issues of social justice, and he would say that event shaped the rest of his life. In South Carolina in the 50s, it meant the immorality of segregation, and also this framing it always as a radical failure to love your neighbor. And the scourge of McCarthyism, which subjected anyone challenging the status quo to be labeled a communist and seen as outside the pale. Later, he became the campus chaplain at Southern Methodist University. He loved working with young people. And he was always in trouble on one issue or another. But academic freedom was the greatest thing that ever happened to him because the university had his back. They might not have liked it that people were calling up and upset, but um, they had his back. My father was a prophetic voice. He always did it in a way that sought to engage people who disagreed with him. And he moved through many issues that he hadn't thought through before, but he was open to pondering, always against the measure, who is my neighbor? And what does it mean to love my neighbor? I read some of his correspondence with colleagues um, where he pled with them to make it possible for people of faith and people of multiple faiths to disagree on issues as divisive as gay rights or as deeply moral as abortion and still agree to disagree with mutual respect and have the conversation. In 1994, he wrote about that event from 52 years before in a little where he'd retired in the mountains of North Carolina, and someone from that church read his article. They invited him back to preach for the first time in 52 years at Washington Street Church. I went. I surprised him, which was great. He preached the same sermon. 
And that's the first time I realized that the fact that I was born in the parsonage in McCormick a year and a half after he gave that sermon had marked me for the rest of my life. There's a reason why when he went to Montgomery to the big march after the Selma and Montgomery march, I met him there as an undergraduate student from Duke. His touchstone, what does it mean to love your neighbor, is a question I invite you to carry with you into your careers, as well as your daily lives and your responsibilities as citizens in a democracy. I frankly think our world is as in need of that prophetic voice now as it has ever been. We are having to learn to understand that we can live with difference and that we can talk across difference. And I can tell you from the, the um, commencement I went to last night here at Concordia, Concordia is beginning to model that world. And I congratulate you for that. And you have some of that to take with you as you go out. Blessings on your journey. Thank you.